Hey, this is Zach Log the Great, and uh, I am here tonight with my friend Nate. Hello. And uh, we are uh, joined tonight uh, by uh, Lacey Fairchild, who, um, among other things, is um, a uh, cartoonist and sometimes writer for uh, Arkhaven's comic strip Hypergamous. Um, and uh, I don't know if you wanted to uh, tell people a little bit about that. Um, sure, yeah. If for anyone who hasn't read Hypergamous before, it's a twice a week four panel comedy strip similar to what you'd see in a newspaper. Uh, it focuses mostly on, um, you know, Vox Day's social sexual hierarchy, which is a super interesting concept to explore, as well as like male female relationships with dating. And just the the actual realities of what that world is like versus what we've been shown in a lot of media over the course of the years. So it's it's lots of fun to try and speak truth to those concepts. Um, very not feminist would be a uh, a short summary of that one. Yeah, it's definitely not feminist. I like the idea of you taking on like, you know, sort of the media tropes because I talk about this with my wife all the time. When we first got together, I wasn't sure how to deal with her because the overwhelming feeling I got when I was with her was over like, you know, actual overt positive happiness. And I had been taught by sitcoms and, you know, like, you know, movies and stuff that's like, no, that's not the thing. It's supposed to be mostly conflict. And then occasionally you're amused by each other. But I was like, being with my wife has taught me how wrong all that ridiculous garbage is. And I'm infinitely thankful to her. Yeah. Yeah. That one thing that threw me off with the way relationships were portrayed in media was just this constantly repeating idea of people who would get bored of each other. That if you were in a monogamous relationship long term, that you'd get bored and and you'd have to run off and seek something else. And it's just I I don't think that's really the truth. I think that, you know, as the longer you're with someone in most cases, like the the more fun it actually gets because you get to know each other better. Yeah, I think it was Michael Knowles. Uh, I was watching his show the other day. He said that if you want to experience infinite variety, stay with one person for your entire life. If you want to get bored of, re of repetition, you know, just go, you know, like just hook up with a bunch of people briefly. And it's true. You only get the real depth and variety once you're at it for a while. So, Sean, this is a new record because we strayed from the poem before we even read it. <laughs> oh, it's a milestone. So, uh, that's okay. So, um, before we get started, uh, one thing I did want to um, say, if uh, you like my work, if you um, want to support my channel, um, you can go to subscribestar.com slash zacklog hyphen the hyphen great. Um, I also wanted to say thank you to a couple of my supporters, um, and that would be um, Ann H. and Dead Messenger. Um, thank you for you know supporting and sticking with me. And having said that, um, let us get the poem up, and we will uh, talk about it. Um, clear that out of the way. Uh, and you guys can let me know when you see that. There it is. Yeah. Oh, and I, I don't know if I said, yes, tonight we're getting together to talk about My Son, My Executioner by Donald Hall. So, um, and I will be our reader tonight. My Son, My Executioner by Donald Hall. My Son. My executioner, I take you in my arms. Quiet and small and just a stir, and whom my body warms. Sweet death, small son, our instrument of immortality. Your cries and hunger document our bodily decay. We... 25 and 22, who seemed to live forever, 
observe enduring life in you and start to die together. Okay. And um, uh, as uh, tonight's guest, uh, Lacey, would you care to uh, kick us off your uh, first thoughts on this? Uh, sure. Um, the first time I read it, I like I had no idea what he was talking about. It threw me off so much. Um, like I thought it had to do with like the death of a child or something. And, and then I like had to go back and look at it again. And, and uh, I got the sense that it, it seems like, you know, with the birth of a child, he's thinking about like it with new life, you start to think about the cycle of life, I guess. And uh, so he's thinking about the cycle of life and death and, um, and how like immortality or, or keeping life going, you know, is only possible through like passing on to the next generation. And, and uh, I'm the one line, I'm not sure about where he says we 25 and 22. I don't know if he's referring to like the age of him and his wife or something. I, I don't know what that means, but it, it, it kind of seems like, like, you know, you'd, he's referring to people who, you know, you seem to live forever. Like, you know, you're in that your twenties, you're kind of, you're still young. You're thinking of, you're not really thinking about death. And then all of a sudden you have new life and it, it, it brings you into that mentality. It makes you start to think about the cycle. Yeah. Um, I, I first read this poem, um, when I was in college, um, and I, um, I liked it then, um, but then when our our first son was born, and like I actually held him, like so I I thought of this and I went and looked it up, and it's just like and, and I read it and I'm like, oh, I I feel like I actually understand this now. Uh, it was it was definitely a moment where it it moved from a very intellectual understanding to, you know, something that, you know, is a little bit more of a punch in the gut. And, um, I really, yeah, I really do love this one. Nate, how about you? Would you like to get started here? My first thought is if my sons are my executioners, I'm dying by firing squad. <laughs> if anybody who doesn't know by the end of this year, I will have half a dozen of those. So, uh, yeah, but I know exactly the feeling, you know, that this guy has is that I'm like, you know, I'm holding this, this brand new baby when my oldest was born. I'm like, all right. <clears throat> it's like, never had one of you guys before, so I don't really know what I'm doing, but you seem to appreciate that I'm here. So let's just do that for a minute. And I'm holding this baby and I'm looking at him. And he's all just sort of, you know, floppy and <laughs> floppy and he smells funny. And I'm just like, I would kill the entire world for you, you floppy, strange little thing. It's like, I would burn it all down. And I don't even really know you. And so it's just, um, I read this, I'm like, yeah, you know what? I feel like you know, it sounds like the, the wording of it makes it sound like, you know, oh, this is grave. And he's like, oh, dear. Blah, blah. But honestly, I, I read this and I find satisfaction. I'm like, yes, good. One of my major purposes is fulfilled here. You know, I have given of myself to the next generation, and this is going to cost me. You know, the energy and the time and the lost sleep and all the things I have to give up to make sure that this little guy moves forward in time. And, you know, goes on to give himself to the generation coming from him. It's going to cost me years. You know, if I if I did everything to just, you know, focused on my own longevity, this guy would not exist. But I want him to. I don't want to live forever. Because I find that, you know, people that tend to want to live 
just just survive for the longest possible span of time tend to leave very little behind. I want to leave, you know, uh, I want to leave half a dozen strong young men who will go out and just said they may not shake the world. Nobody may know who they are outside of, you know, the, the people they meet in their life person. Nobody may know who I am. That's fine. But what I want is that they will have been people that made the lives of people around them better. I'm hoping that their sons and daughters, if they have it, you know, their sons and daughters will go forward and help people around them. And maybe we can start a little ripple here of making things better. And who knows? One day it'll swell. And so, yeah. That my son, my executioner, and I observe the enduring life in you, and I start to die. And that's great. Because I don't need to be here for, I don't need to be here forever. Because now I know that I can pass on <laughs> what wisdom I have to you and your brothers. And yeah, if I can do that, then I will have accomplished most of my goal in life. Yeah, and the um, one thing you said in there actually reminded me of, um, what is it? There's, um, I don't know if either of you have read uh, The Great Divorce uh, by C.S. Lewis. I have heard the audio book. Yeah, and like at one point, like, um, you know, these, these uh, short, uh, short version for those who haven't read it, um, it's a group of people uh, briefly visiting heaven on a tour. Um, and at one point they see um, someone go by and, you know, there's this basically this great pageant and it's this um, this wonderful, you know, this person is like supremely honored. And, um, you know, someone says, you know, well, who is that? And he says, oh, that is one of, you know, one of heaven's greatest saints. And he's like, oh, really? Who was who was she on Earth? Uh, you never heard of her. Uh, she was not famous. She was not, you know, world changing. But she just made the lives of everyone around her better. And no one outside of her town will ever hear of her. But because of, you know, how she was to those around her, like she is, you know, highly honored here. And that's an an interesting perspective. Um, but yeah, the, um, it's going to sound, well, it, so like, yeah, the, it's, you know, this, the poem, um, you know, it's about, you know, you know, the circle of life. Um, I probably shouldn't sing. Um, but it wasn't the worst. It's, uh, thing <laughs> but, you know, um, you know, they have they have a they have a child and in some sense you know that kid is their immortality you know they're going to you know i'm going to die someday but after i die a, at least a little piece of me is going to live on in each of my kids um and at the same time you know it's not just um at, at the very same time the fact that they're here you know, it's, uh, what is it? You know, we 25 and 22 who seem to live forever observe enduring life in you and start to die together. And it's like, I'm, you know, you're a young person, you're 25, you're 22, you know, the, uh, you know this young couple, you're not really thinking about death. It's not like, you're intellectually aware of it, but it's not something you really like understand. And then you see, you know, this baby and you're like, Oh, I'm older. And this kid's going to still be here. And it's, it's kind of this contradiction. It's both, it's both immortality and death in the same thing. And it's just, yeah. Fascinating. Uh, North star. How about you or Lacey? Um, yeah, like it, I mean, my thoughts are kind of, you know, same vein as what you were saying, like where it's, 
it's that contradiction. It's like when the new life comes along, that's kind of one of the best reminders of mortality. It's like, um, even, you know, if you see a baby and you're just like, oh, like I was one of these once, like, look how changed I am. Like, and, you know, and it goes back to that cycle and you're just like, um, and it's also like, you know, oh, once this baby is, you know, 25 or 22, once this baby is where I am now, what will I be then? Like, it's, it just opens up this whole question of, um, like, yeah, mortality and purpose and life cycles that you just, you, you wouldn't see, I don't think, and you wouldn't think about as much if you, you know, you were never in that position. Um, well, and yeah. And the other thing with that is like, and you know, women get this, or women get this about like, you know, seven or eight months or, you know, earlier than guys. Cause you know, I'm sorry, we're kind of stupid until we actually see that kid. It's not 100% real to us. Um, it, it, I mean, we, we know it's coming, but like until we actually see it and hold it, it's still kind of a, just an idea to us. Um, but, um, but like, you know, the instant I, you know, held my son, suddenly my you know, my perspective, my, um, my priorities, you know, shifted and it's like, oh, I've got to care what happens about after what care about what happens after I'm gone. Because, you know, if you don't have kids, you know, if you, if you, you, you know, live to 85 and die, what happens the very, if the entire world blows up the very next day, that's not your problem. Yeah, you know, but if you do have kids, you know, what happens to the world after you're gone is very important. And so, you know, my, you know, my uh, perspective, my, um, you know, priorities as to what, what mattered, you know, suddenly extended about another 30 years into the future. Um, and, you know, people who don't have that are i think just a, at least a little more short sighted and that's a troubling especially when there are more and more people in that situation yeah like, i think um, oh sorry no by all means people hear my oh. voice too much <laughs> um, well, I, was, I was just going to go back to like with you saying like you know you're your male perspective on, you know, suddenly having a baby and being in that position. And, um, and then the poem too is like written by a man, you know, looking at his newborn son. And I just kind of had a thought like it, it would be interesting to see a poem of this sort of concept, but written from the perspective of a woman, because it is definitely different for women. Like it, there's still definitely a separation like between a baby that's like unborn and then once they're born, like it's different for women too, right? The baby is born and then all of a sudden you're just like, oh, this, like, this is who you were. Like, it's you, like, you know, you're a mystery before. I had no idea this was you, like, and so you, you almost only have like half a connection and then they're born and, and it's like, oh, the mystery solved a little bit. But um, I think that, it is like, you know, with women, when you first get pregnant or when you're trying to get pregnant, that's when I think a woman really does start thinking about the next 30 years or whatever. Cause it's, it's like the, the nine, 10 months of pregnancy is definitely like, so, it's something that a woman really does experience very deeply. Oh, and, and I was also going to say like, it's just as far as the concepts of you know, newborn babies and death, like there is this quite es established idea that when a woman is giving birth, she goes into a place of dying as well. Like she goes through a death of her old self and 
comes out the other side like reborn into like the new phase of her life like you know she goes from maiden to mother you know and uh there's a death involved and when you see women talking about pregnancy and birth and babies like the idea of death and dying and all that comes up over and over and over again there's there's so many different kinds of deaths that occur in like the formation and birthing of a new baby well yeah that's and cool. you know oh go ahead that's actually what i was thinking uh, i was exactly that last point you made is that when i was when i became a father you know and uh I've got this little baby. I'm trying to take care of him, you know. You know, she, my wife will kind of hand him off to me, like, here you go. I need to sleep. It's your turn. You know, and I'm sitting there playing Battlefield with my friend, and the baby's in his little, you know, his little thing over here. And he's sleeping, and like, wakes up and starts crying. I've just got to drop what I'm doing and go. So, I mean, I had to shed my skin becoming a new dad. Like, there were a lot of things that I used to be that I just, I couldn't spare the time and attention. In. I used to be, like, you know, a relatively hardcore gamer. Like, I'd actually worry about learning the map, you know, figuring out what's the best way to do stuff. Kind of, you know, just how to be as effective as I could with the things I like to do. And it was about the time that my second son was born that I was trying to play a game. I was getting just to use a phrase from the olden times, I was getting raffle stuff. Just people are tap dancing on my forehead. And I'm just like, uh, why can I, why can I not do this? I'm like, I don't know what this map is. And I don't really, this is so dumb. Why? It's like, I don't know where anything's coming from. I don't understand what's happening to me. And then I was just like, it's like, but I'm just going to, it's like, yeah, you know, I just don't know this map very well. And I don't care. And then boom, it hit me. I had become a filthy casual. <laughs> but then I also, you know, but since then I've also learned that I've got less time to be mad about stuff because I can't sit around being angry about what somebody in Washington did as much as I used to be able to because, well, the kids want to talk to me about Pokemon and, you know, how his brother smacked him in the head with something you know, what the cat did or where the dog pooped. And I'm just like, <laughs> okay, guys, this is great. And so is that I, I have become a different person. So that whole thing about dying and death is absolutely true. You know, mothers and fathers alike, it changes us, hopefully for the better if you let it. Like I said, people hear my voice too much because I talk about it. <laughs> Oh, but, um, yeah, it's, so, I, I'm gonna preface this, like, I know it sounds a little weird, um, but, like, you have to go through the whole thing, like, I, I, like I said, when my first son was born, like, I read this, and then I, I was like, yeah, and I was like, it's kind of okay if I, like, I'm going to die, and someday, and I'm kind of okay with that now. It's like, not I want to die, like nothing like that, um, but just like, you know, again, something else is still going to be here. You know, there's, there's, a, there's something of me is going to last in the world. And, you know, I mean, some people, you know, can do, you know, enormous things that, you know, change, you know, big things that, you know, change the world and, you know, and leave a mark in art or science or philosophy or whatever. Um, I hope some of the things I've done, you know, intellectually, you know, last. But, you know, I, I'm not, you know, William Shakespeare. I'm not even Donald Hall. Um, and so, like, you know, I have, you know, there is still going to be something of me, you know, after after I'm gone because... There's these two guy. There's these you know two little guys so far, who you know each of them has is a little bit of me and a little bit of my wife and a little bit all themselves, and it's it is 
it is both like accepting of death and accepting of death and like happily you know welcoming new life at exactly the same time and it's a very strange thing i feel a bit like it goes into that whole thing we've discussed numerous other times this is sort of i feel like a facet of dying well and it's like yes i've done something worthy and it's costing me not my entire life but a portion and i feel like this is just sort of one facet of like i said of dying well yeah and um it one thing you had mentioned zach Log, about like you know oh, i'm i'm not shakespeare or whatever and it uh that was one of the things that really clicked for me like in my early 20s where i was just i realized that you know a lot of people and myself included had this desire to be basically like loved and adored and you kind of fantasize about that in a sense of like wanting to be famous or leave behind a legacy or do some kind of amazing art or something like that like do something amazing and and then I, I realized one day I was like you know who is going to love you and admire you and think that you're cooler and want to be around you more than your children and your family like if you have that desire to do something great and create some kind of like you know beautiful piece of art or legacy it's like you know you show your art or your writing to your children or even just yourself just like you know being yourself around your family like they are going to be the ones who give you that and that clicked for me and, and you know immediately after that i started getting baby fever <laughs> <laughs> not yet i mean yeah and you know not yeah, relatively few people are going to leave, you know, some kind of, you know, intellectual, you know, you know, legacy. Um, and that's just the way the world is. Um, but I think most people and, and, and relatively and by definition, not everybody gets to be famous. Um, uh, I think the Internet uh, among you know benefits and drawbacks, I think that may be a drawback of the internet that a lot more people are um, you know dreaming of fame for fame's sake. Um, but like most people, if they wanted to, you know, could you know be good parents. I mean, a lot of people aren't, unfortunately. Um, but like most people could you know, have kids and, you know, pay attention to them and take care of them to the extent where, you know, uh, what is it? Um, I, I feel like this is almost like a Hallmark card thing, but like, you know, you can't, you can't be something to the whole, you, you can't be someone to the whole world, but you can be the whole world to someone. Um, well, just because and, it's false doesn't mean it's false. <laughs> Yeah, and it's, you know, you're, you know, if you're a parent and you actually invest in your kids and you take care of them, you are the whole world to them. And, you know, that will, you know, that will pay you back on the other end. Also, if you don't take care of them and, you know, don't, you know, treat them well, that will pay you back also in a different way. Um and, you know, you can see examples of that, too. <sighs> but um, what was. Uh... Um, so, yeah, another. Um, so, you know, the middle part of this, you know. Your uh, sweet death, small son, our instrument of immortality, your cries and hunger document our bodily decay. And it's the same, you know, the same thing at the very same time. This is the most, in one sense, like this is the most alive person you're ever going to meet. You know, you hold your baby who, you know, just got there and they have, you know, an entire life ahead of them. Um, and at the same time, 
the, how dependent they are and how how much they need you and you know how how much you have to take care of them shows cuz like you know a newborn human that's a pretty fragile thing <laughs> you know um as compared to pretty much any other animal on earth newborn humans are are you know absolutely going to die immediately if you're not right there with them and you know and in that there you know are the again reminder of life and death at the same time and it's yeah a fascinating contradiction yeah i was just i was looking at that verse right before you brought it up like and think because you had mentioned a contradiction before too like you know you have this new baby and then you start thinking about death and how it seems to contradict but how they go together and and uh it's just like such an interestingly put together verse because like you know it's like he says oh it's a sweet death and then he's like oh the instrument of our immortality you know a contradiction and then right after saying immortality he talks about bodily decay like again this back and forth contradicting these two ideas of like dying and rotting and in like a pretty visceral kind of way, like this very mortal, you know, like hunger, decay, like all that kind of stuff, but alongside this idea of like immortality and, and uh, it's, it's just, it's a very interesting verse. Like, I guess that's kind of the whole idea with poetry is like the more you actually look at how these words are put together, like it's actually really, really cool. That's uh, well, and that's, you know, you know, like I, I did a video a, a couple months ago, like why why I memorize poetry and y you should too. Um, and, you know, that's the fascinating thing about well-written poetry. Like you read it the first time and you're like, okay, yeah, I get it. And then, you know, you keep going through it, you know, over and over again. And, you know, if it's really well done, like it keeps on coming up with new things and it keeps on, it keeps on changing, you know, you know, changing each time you read it. And that's, that's a really fascinating thing. And it's, you know, you know, credit as much credit as possible to writers who do that. And it's, um, it's also, I think a, you know, I I've done one, I've done a few poems where I'm like, I don't think this is great poetry, but I, I like, you know, what it's saying. Um, and those ones, like you read through it the first time, and you pretty much got it. Um, but like you know, this one, you know, and you know, a lot of others I've done, you read through it, and each time you read through it, you're pulling new things out, and it's it's changing in you, and it's fascinating how that process works. Mm -hmm. I also like how the poem kind of. I don't know, maybe this uh, experience is different for you, but it really also kind of parallels the both of the immense love and satisfaction and the unutterable frustration of having a small child. <laughs> you're just like, like, I love you to death. It's like I would put out a fire with my own blood to save you. But right now. I am so furious with you because I cannot figure out why you won't stop crying. You have been fed. You have pooped. You have been changed. I am sitting here bouncing you and, you know, patting you and snuggling you. And you are going to deafen me by screaming straight into my ear. What is the freaking deal, child? It's kind of funny. My um... dualities with small children. Uh, it's kind of funny. My uh, my sister, um, she said um, they didn't understand this at the time, but like their oldest son actually was a really easy as a baby. It was just really easy to get along with and like, you know, was was was, you know, calm and like, you know, and, you know, didn't kick up a fuss once you got once you took care of, you know, the things he clearly needed. Yeah, no problem. And then they had their second son, and they were just absolutely, you know, dumbfounded because it's like, but, but we fed you, 
and you've slept, and, you know, mommy is holding you. Why are you still crying? And, um, you know, they, they, they had, uh, you know, it would... Uh, it would some it would pro- possibly be a little bit uh you know easier on the uh, e- easier on the psyche um having it go in the other direction like he's not crying why is he not crying at us i don't understand um. oh, and, but then the funny part is you get like you know all this stuff and then it like all of a sudden the kid just like okay turns off the switch goes to sleep and you're just like suddenly it's like the best feeling in the world again because you're like ah and, well, maybe not for Lacey, but for me, it's like, ah, I'm a good father. Yes. Mm. But, yeah, oh, God. Just, what's funny is with the, the twins, uh, apparently I was the pro at getting them to sleep. Like, my wife would have trouble sometimes. Like, I need you to do the thing. And I'd be like, okay. So I'd go over there, load the babies up in each arm, sit in her uh, recliner, rock them, and sing them sea shanties. And they'd just be like, bad. <laughs> It's like, nice. Y'all are going to drop off to me, you know, sort of grumbling my way through the Wellerman. Or Northwest Pass. Uh, well, um, okay. I feel like I've said most of the things I want to about this. Um, Nate, how about you? Are there any other, any other uh, big things we haven't hit on yet? I want to point out to people who don't understand this, who may be listening, that when I say this is part of dying well, when I talk about, you know, I am totally cool with the co- with this costing me my life, that I mean that because we all like, parents like to sit around and gripe and tell horror stories about how difficult, <laughs> terrible, and frustrating and trying and tiring exhausting even this whole thing can be because that's easy to do right and that's we were talking about this before uh, you know started that, that whole sitcom idea of family it's, oh gosh the baby and then i was changing him and he like you know sprayed liquid poop all over the room and you know uh he just then he barfed down my back and i'm like yeah i've had all those things happen to me but you know what I've had more of is quiet little moments with my infant and growing sons that I wouldn't give up for any. You know, well, I, and the I've, other- seen them, I've seen them have these realizations. I've seen them grow and actually, you know, become people. And, you know, they'll ask me these questions and we'll talk about different things like, you know, just about the nature of everything. And I live for those moments. Or, you know, they'll be like, you know, Dad, I was pretty upset about this, but I'm glad we talked. Or, you know, they're crying because they can't solve a problem. I can come over there and give them just a little tip, and I see it click in their little brain. All of a sudden, they just light up, and they're like, oh, Dad, I did it. Oh, I would be a hollow and empty man without my children. Even married, I would be a hollow and empty man. Because I love my wife, and she completes me as a person. But that completion is only deepened and strengthened by our, the way that we raise our children. And I well, cannot and the imagine other... about these little guys. And so I'm telling you, everyone out there, young single people or married people who don't have kids yet and don't really want them, you want them. They're hard. They're the hardest thing you will ever do in your life. And they are the only thing that is worth that kind of difficulty. And they are absolutely worth that kind of difficulty. You may be worried about the state of the world and all is it right to bring children into it. Yes. Because without us, without our children, this world is a meaningless ball of matter spinning through a void, you know, around the you know, around this, you know, this corner of the galaxy's biggest campfire. Who cares? It says. Without people to give it meaning, who cares? And so we are the ones who provide those people and shape those people and shape the meanings that they will assign to things. 
it is a sacred duty, but it is it is a sacred duty is a sacrifice of your very life, but it will enrich your soul and it is infinitely worth it. You want kids. What well, and the other the other thing with that is um it's it's really easy to explain to other people and including to other people who don't have kids, like, okay, I had this problem with my kid, you know, oh, you know, like you said, you know, it, it's easy to explain what a mess they can make. And like, you know, you pull off the diaper and he immediately starts peeing on you. And you're like, you, you could have taken <laughs> care of that earlier. Um, and it's really easy to get across those things. Getting across, like communicating the, the good things, communicating how much more interesting your life is now and how much more worthwhile everything is, that's really tough. It doesn't come across in the same way. And so it's, you know, it, it's you know, an unfortunate, you know, an unfortunate facet of being human it's easy to make the bad things clear and it's easy to talk all about them and focus on that and if you don't you know deliberately if you don't deliberately make yourself think about other things sometimes and so yeah i guess to try um, to, to try i'm sorry i keep to try and get this uh you know to point out to people like this is this is the gist of it, right? This is where you get the payback. Because I tell this story to people a lot because when I is the proudest moment of my life. I have been an undergraduate in a number of places. I have, you know, completed a college degree. I went through basic training. I won awards and promotions while I was in the military. All these things are great and I'm proud of them. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. This is the proudest moment of my life that I'm about to relate. Wife was out she was off with friends or something i had the i had the babies and so our oldest son he wasn't i don't think he ever slept through the night until he was two and a half years old he would always wake up and have some he needs soup the second son like you put him down and he turns into a brick and he's like Bleh. he's done he's over but the older boy he's waking up he's having a hard time sleeping and so you know I go in there and he's just crying. He's bawling his poor little head. He woke up and he wasn't happy. So I go and pick him up. And he's still got his eyes closed. But he's... So I picked him up. I'm holding him on my shoulder. I pat him and shush him a little bit. And I can see kind of out of the tail of my eyes. You know, keep an eye on him. That he opens his eyes. He looks over at me. And then he just... Closes his eyes again, lays his head down, throws this giant sigh, just <sighs> dad, dad. And like two seconds later, he's asleep. Felt like I had conquered the entire world. Felt like I had, you know, climbed Mount Everest, found a gold, like, a, you know, a pot of gold up there, slung it over my back, and then flapped my arms and flew home. Like, just all the, all the best things. Because I am the kind of, I had apparently, somehow, despite myself, become the kind of man that this tiny little soul trusted. And that just by being there and give him a little pat and a little, hey, it's okay, boy, would soothe whatever was bothering him so much and give him peace again. That's the best, that's the best illustration of why it's worth it that I can give you. And that's it. Like you said, Sean, nobody will fully understand it until they have their own kids. But I hope at least it gives you some idea. So, Lacey, how about you? Any um, last thoughts on this tonight? Um, 
I guess uh, I was thinking a bit about like the title in the first line, like just the, you know, my son, my executioner, just, the, and it just goes, it goes back to the ideas we were talking about before, but it just kind of is really summed up there where it's just like when you have a child, like you die and you're something else but what you were before dies like your children are your executioners like they they kill who you were before them and i think maybe that's why so many people are so scared to have kids because like you know what are humans but like terrified of death right like and and it i think even people who haven't really thought about it that much, I think we do have this instinctual sense that, you know, if you have children, you will not be the same. Like your old self, your old life, your old presuppositions, like they they all just get wiped out, you know? And, you know, through whatever experiences you have with your children, like it's different for everyone, but whatever it is that they do when, when they're interacting with you, like, you know, you're, you're never the same. Um, yeah. And, um, and actually what, you know, both of you uh, were just saying, reminded me of something and I, I had posted this um, idea on uh, social galactic a couple weeks back which is um, like hope is one of the um, one of the the uh, uh, cr great Christian virtues, the theological virtues, um, and it's to the extent that Christianity elevates it, it is unique to Christianity. Um, it's you know it's kind of weird for us to try and think about it that way. Cause it's so much a part of our world and Christianity has influenced our culture so much, but like, you know, relative to, you know, Japan or like, you know, middle Eastern culture, hope is, you know, we are commanded to hope and like, you know, the world can seem like a dark place. And especially the past couple of years, you're like, Wow, this is kind of all horrible. Um, but we are commanded to hope. And I can't, especially for people who could choose otherwise, I cannot think of a more concrete expression of hope than of choosing to have a, have a child. Um, because that is saying that however bad it gets, I think it is good that we continue. Um, and so, you know, at, like I said, as a Christian, we are commanded to hope. And I do not know any any way of acting that out more than, you know, than you know, get married, have a kid and, you know, push life on. And... Um, <sighs> anyway, um, so uh, I think we've covered this one pretty well. Um, thank you, Nate, and uh, thank you, uh, Lacey, for joining us tonight. And uh, God be with you. And also, thank you. Thanks for having me.